Hi, everyone. Thanks so much uh, for, for being here. Um, like Rob said, I'm Scott Mobley. I'm the executive director at the National Society of Collegiate Scholars. We are a uh, honor society working with schools across the country, and I'm very happy to have Laura Horn here as well. She's the chief program officer at Active Mind, and uh, she'll tell you a little bit about them in just a moment. So you're aware the uh, NCHC website will have this presentation uh, posted later on. So if you do get something uh, out of this that you really like, um, you'll be able to find it to, to watch again or, or share with your peers. So thanks again, Rob. Um, we are here to talk about mental health and high achieving students. So I'm really happy that all of you have joined today. Um, thanks for taking time out of your day, and I hope you get a lot out of this. Uh, we discovered a lot at NSCS uh, through our research with Active Minds, um, and I hope you take a few things home that you uh, didn't have this morning, even though now I, you're probably at home, but I think you know what I mean. So we'll have a Q&A session at the end of this, uh, so please do use that chat function. Um, send any questions that you have, and we'll try to answer as many as we, as we can at the end. So what is NSCS? If you're not familiar with us, we're a nonprofit honor society. Um, we're 26 years old, and we serve over 300 colleges and universities across the country. Um, we have about one and a quarter million lifetime members who have joined NSCS since 1994 and about 150,000 um, that are students right now. If you have any uh, further questions about us, feel free to ask uh, or uh, send me an email. My email will be up later. And then I'll let you, I'll let Laura, um, Laura, you can tell them a little bit about Active Mind. Sure, thanks so much for, for having me, Scott and Rob and NCHC and, and having me represent Active Minds. Um, it's a real honor to be here. Um, 20 years ago, our executive director and founder, Allison Malman, lost her only brother, Brian, to suicide when he was a college freshman. And Brian was a high achieving student. He was smart, he was popular, he was fun. He was at the top of his class in high school. He got into his top choice university, Columbia, and was a dean's list student every semester. He was very well rounded. Um, but after his death, Allison's family learned that despite Brian's charisma and sense of humor and outgoing nature and great success as a student, he had been suffering in silence for years. And so Allison was really determined to do something about that. So she started Active Minds from her dorm room to educate and activate students to change campus mental health culture among their peers and to save lives. And today we have a presence on more than 800 campuses with a reach of more than 5 million students. And this includes um, a network of student-led chapters at 585 campuses across all 50 states. And together we're working with our student advocates to encourage their peers to learn about and talk about and seek help for mental health issues, just as they would for a physical issue without shame or silence. And we develop programming and resources um, to elevate the student voice and shift attitudes around mental health in our culture and the greater society. Great, thanks Laura. So our founder, Steve Laughlin, was a student affairs professional when he started in SCS in 1994. So student development has always been kind of at the, uh, the forefront of what we do, it's one of our focal points. So, um, I know when I started at NSCS in 2011, one of the first thing that, things that I noticed was the particularly high pressure that students put on themselves, or the students that, that we work with in particular. So oftentimes our student leaders have part-time, full-time jobs. They're taking on 18 hours of courses and they're in other groups aside from NSCS. So I, I just remember reminding students that if they're not having fun with NSCS, they're doing something, we're doing something wrong. We need to figure it out. And I know that you all have experienced this too, working with, working with this uh, demographic. So it made a lot of sense for us to partner with Active Mind to help bring mental health awareness to our members. Um, and it's really done a world of good. So uh, I wanna talk a little bit about Gen Z. And, and first I'll note that of course, not all of our, not all college students belong to that 
generation. About 20% of our members are not Gen Z. But the bulk of them are, and I think that's where we're gonna focus a lot of our talk today. So Gen Z encompasses those who were born uh, between 1995 and 2015. And generally we see a lot of multitasking, high expectations of, on themselves, and a focus on individuality. Um, this generation is really diverse, which Laura will talk a little bit about later. And there are lots of priorities. College costs more than it used to. And, and today there are these unprecedented circumstances that we're living in. Um, the upside of this um, is that uh, this generation is also really informed and they care a lot about things that matter. Um, mental health disorders are very common. And in this, the research that we did with our members and Active Minds, that's the first thing that jumps out at us. So we know that they're common on campuses and that they're usually not treated. 46% of students um, in, our, in our research experience significant mental health issues. And that number grows from year to year. So this data is from last year um, and doesn't even uh, include you know, what's happened over the past few months. About 9.2 million college students are experiencing a diagnosable mental health concern. And for comparison, that's more than the entire population of the state of New Jersey. So uh, we're talking about a lot of people. I'm going to have uh, Laura, you can uh, talk a little bit about uh, some research. Sure. Yeah. So what Scott just shared, the 9.2 million are students who have a diagnosable mental health issue. They're dealing with anxiety or depression or, or something very serious that really needs treatment. And when we take a broader lens to mental health and ask our students, how are they feeling more generally beyond the scope of mental illness? We see that 87% of students report feeling overwhelmed at some point over the last year and 53% have feeling actually been having felt hope, hopeless at some point over the last year. And we see these numbers tend to, to slightly increase year over year. Let me go to the next slide, Scott. Um, in the next slide, you'll see that also as students with mental health issues, um, the percentage of students with mental health issues continues to climb over time. Um, students who report thoughts of suicide also tend to increase year over year. And you can see in this chart um, from the Healthy Mind study, which is a national study of, um, of universities across the country, that in 2007, the number, the percentage of students reporting suicidal ideation was as low as about 6%. And then the most recent study in 2018, you see that it's, it's um, now at uh, just over around 13%. So it is just about doubled in the span of a decade. And that's something that um, folks in the mental health field are very concerned with is learning more about why we're seeing an increase in anxiety and depression over time and also in, in suicidal ideation. We can go to the next slide. We also know from the National Healthy Mind Study that um, Almost half of our student body, as Scott talked about, is experiencing a diagnosable mental health issue. And of them, only about one third of, of students are in treatment. So we know that it's common and yet it's not commonly treated. Um, and that's also a, a top concern. We can go to the next slide. And if we want to dive in deeper and learn more about the 46% of students who are experiencing a mental health issue, the data indicates that they are largely undergraduate students and that they are studying across all disciplines. Although interestingly, we do see slightly higher rates among students in the arts, in the humanities, in public health and social sciences. And we need more research in this area to know why, but there are um, thoughts that graduate students, for example, have more protective factors and that they are a little bit older and so less in a vulnerable time in their development development um, and um, other factors that might be um, supporting them a little bit in ways that undergraduate students don't have. Go to the next slide. Students with marginalized gender and sexual identities um, also have a greater likelihood of experiencing mental health issues than their peers. And although mental health stigma is actually very low across students generally, the students in general are very open to help seeking and talking very openly about their mental health. We see that help seeking is significantly lower among international students and students of color than that of their peers. 
We also know that generally private, residential, and selective schools um, see lower rates of mental illness among their students compared to other types of schools. And a larger percentage of students with mental health issues at private, residential, and selective schools are receiving treatment. So in these smaller schools, um, it's been a lot easier for students to get the treatment they need, where, whereas um, in more larger, um, residential campuses, there's less of, of, of a culture there of seeking help. Next slide. And as I mentioned, you know, the million dollar question for all of us in this moment um, and in this area is, is why are mental health issues on the rise among our youth and why do we continue to see anxiety and depression among our youth rise each year? And there's unfortunately not yet a clear answer, though researchers agree that it's likely a combination of issues. Um, and there's some data out there that can give us some clues. For example, we know that the likelihood of experiencing mental health issues is higher for students who are under financial stress, for students who have experienced sexual assault, um, for students who are struggling with their sleep, and of course, students who report having experienced discrimination of some kind. What we do know for sure, however, is that treatment is very effective at supporting students with succeeding. Um, and so always the number one goal is improving access to care for students, especially students who are more at risk or less likely to, to seek help. Um, and, and some of the most important work happening in college mental health right now is trying to demonstrate with data that improving mental health outcomes improves academic success and graduation rates, but mostly because we want to kind of incentivize university leaders to prioritize mental health. And so we're really trying to speak to that bottom line and show that connection between graduation rates and um, mental health. But the unintended consequence of such important work is that we can perhaps assume that students with high GPAs are not struggling. And again, this can play into some unhealthy and inaccurate images that we all likely have gotten from our culture, that mental health issues and those who experience them look and act in a certain way. But this is not always true, and we see that in our data with NSCS, which Scott is going to share more about. So I wanted uh, to share something written by one of our student leaders, uh, Stephanie, which is pretty impactful. It gives a good example of what um, today's college students are experiencing and had some good advice from their peers. So um, this is what she wrote. I am and always have been an overachiever. I strive for the best grade in class and wouldn't settle for less. I would accept every leadership position I could even when I didn't have the time left in my schedule. And when I messed up, and yes, I messed up quite a bit, I drove myself into a frenzy. I continued to put an unhealthy amount of pressure on myself. That is until my junior year when I stopped and realized that I had stretched out the days as far as I possibly could. I had this idea in my head, that because I did well in the past, I had to continue doing well or it would make me a failure somehow. But I noticed a pattern when my grades would slip because I missed one assignment or I forgot a deadline or become too worried and stressed to try to catch up on future deadlines and assignments. My stress over the small stuff helped half the problem and redirected me away from the bigger picture of my life. If I could give advice to current and future college students, I would tell them this, your worth is not measured by your GPA. It's not measured by the internships that you get or the age that you graduate. This might seem like weird advice coming from a student who sits on a national board for an honor society that in fact does focus on student GPAs. However, I'm not there because of my GPA. And that is now what I finally understand. I'm on the board because of my personality and my characteristics, my passion and my drive. And there because I am me. And I truly believe that my colleagues would feel the same about the scholars in the society. NSCS is here to elevate students who did well and to celebrate their achievements every step of the way. So yes, hard work in college, uh, work hard in college and do your best. Know that sometimes you're going to slip up, but you're also going to excel. The important thing is to let go of the slip up and take time to celebrate the successes in life. Um, and Stephanie has been a great, um, great leader for her, for her chapter and for NSCS. And um, I, I just wanted to share that, which I thought was pretty, um, pretty powerful. So last year we completed um, a wellness survey along with Active Mind. And we uh, saw 9,319 respondents his GPA was 3.4 or higher over the span of six days. Um, a small number were graduates, but 20% were seniors, 33% juniors, 38% sophomores, and 8% freshmen. 
90% were enrolled in a bachelor's degree program, 92% were enrolled full time. The common areas of study were social sciences, business, natural sciences and mathematics, humanities, language, philosophy, um, engineering and education. So it was a very good mix of majors. We learned a lot, but here are some of the, the key findings. We found that 91% of students felt overwhelmed by what they had to do in the last, in the last year, which is higher than the number um, that we mentioned earlier, which was 87% of the national average. 73% of respondents have sought help from someone um, in the last 12 months, and that would include um, friends, family, and um, professional help. 40%, 46 percent of respondents believe that most people think less of a person who has received mental health treatment. So that stigma does still remain, and that's why we're fortunate to have organizations like Active Minds. More than 50 percent reported that either they do not have enough time or financial resources, or that they prefer to deal with their issues on their own. Next to the counseling center and close friends, students reported a preference to seeking help from an academic advisor or a professor. And then unfortunately, more than two thirds of students surveyed, surveyed said that they do not feel comfortable doing so. So while it's clear that the work is cut out uh, for those of us who work with high achieving populations, uh, fortunately we have put, uh, we have Active Minds has put together recommendations based on this uh, research that we did um, and uh, ways that we can bridge the gap, so to speak, with those uh, two thirds who and help them become more comfortable seeking help. So I'll, I'll pass it over to you again, Laura, and you can uh, go through the, the recommendation. Awesome. So um, people who, who often work with students often want to know what to look for and then how to respond if a student is struggling and a few behaviors that may be a sign that it's at least um, worth checking in and asking if the student is doing okay is um, if they're not showing up when they're expected to for assignments, classes, or whatever it might be, they're not responding to your communication and they normally do, um, or statements that are such as I'm really stressed or I'm feeling overwhelmed. In most cases, we all know students who would say they're feeling stressed, and in most cases, um, they're probably not struggling with anything too serious, but um, any of those signs are worth checking in and asking and really prompting for more information if you get a default response such as I'm fine or I'm okay. Um, and in doing so, it kind of communicates to the student that you are um, valuing them as a whole person and not just their academics or not just for the reasons in which you're, you're um, communicating with them um, in relation to your organization. Um, and in many cases, students who are struggling can be helped just through a show of compassion with active listening and appropriate responses. And we have a simple three-step conversation tool we share with folks called um, VAR, Validate, Appreciate, and Refer. We can first validate what students are going through by saying things like, that sounds really difficult. And um, not judging them, not trying to um, say things like, well, at least it's not like this, or at least you, know, you have this, especially during COVID-19 when I think so many students are feeling guilty if what they're really struggling with is just focusing on school and they haven't lost anybody. Um, you know, just validating the experience that students are going through no matter, how, no matter what it is. Um, can really be powerful and it, it feels small, but a lot of times what we tend to do is kind of skip that validation stage and then try to fix the problem or try to offer something that works for us, but may, may not work with them. And so it's a critical piece actually to first before we do anything to kind of validate um, that, that it's hard for that student, whatever it is that they're experiencing. Um, it's also, it can be really hard for students to speak up. It takes courage for them to share with someone that they're struggling. So, you know, after validating them, letting them know if they made the right choice. And, and you can say things like, you know, thank you so much for sharing that, or it really helps me to know that. Thank you so much. Or, you know, even saying like, I know it can be hard and I really appreciate you, you did that. And now we can figure out what to do together. It can really go a long way. And then that third step is refer. Um, referring students to resources, any resources on campus that we are aware of. And if we follow those three steps, we can serve as a helper 
while not feeling like we're overstepping or doing more that we're able to. And I read in the comments that many of you have been through suicide prevention training, like mental health first aid, and maybe you've been through QPR, um, which are really great resources and important. Um, VAR is meant to complement those resources. We have heard from students that in most cases, when they're trying to support a peer, in mo most cases, those students are just struggling with everyday challenges. They're not in a crisis. And it's important to know um, how to support a student who's in an immediate crisis. And your campus um, probably has protocol in place for what you should do what, in terms of confidentiality, what you can promise and what you can't promise to a student and what you're charged to do as a staff member if you were working at a campus. Um, but if you're just trying to support a student who might be having everyday challenges, we really recommend VAR. Um, and we recommend that if you're not a trained clin clinician, that you take the responsibility to learn what kind of resources are out there that you can point to a student to and not try to fill that, that role yourself. And I hope that that will kind of ease any hesitancy we have in supporting students and just knowing that what we're there for is to validate them, um, thank them, be there for them, and to be able to refer them to the appropriate resources when they're ready for those resources. And there are lots of national um, services out there that are 24 seven and free, such as the crisis text line and the national suicide prevention lifeline. And what I always like to share with folks is that the crisis text line is really for any any concern. Um, a student doesn't have to be experiencing thoughts of suicide to call the crisis text line. Lots of students call when they're having a breakup um, or when they're struggling with their academics. And many students um, who don't want to pick up the phone and call can use the crisis text line to actually text and connect with resources there. Um, the other thing I like to share is that the number one thing students have said in our survey that they prize the most from people in their lives was approachability. And that's why we recommend um, just specific, simple actions that can help communicate that we're approachable to students and send the message that we care about them beyond their academics, um, such as posting mental health resources on our websites or wherever we are communicating with students so that they can access to them. When we talk to faculty, we encourage them to put mental health resources on their course syllabi in the same way that they might um, Put academic or tutoring resources and in the chat box I typed in um, a new faculty guide there that includes our sample syllabi statement that you can just take and copy and paste into your syllabus if you if you are a faculty member. Um, we can also verbalize to students that they can come to us for any reason so although we might be talking to them about an application or about a certain process we can use our relationship with them to communicate that if, if you need anything you know, come to me and let me know so that students can feel like they can go through any door um, and, and get the help that they need and that you are a safe person that they can talk to if they do run into an issue where they really need somebody um, to lean on. Um, a couple other things, you know, we encourage staff to avoid setting deadlines at midnight, um, like we so often do by deadline and instead require applications or assignments to be turned in at a time that encourages students to get the support they need, the sleep that they need. We practice that at our national office as well. Um, many institutions and conferences are now infusing mindful moments into their curriculum or schedules, and it doesn't have to be, you know, a, a, a big ordeal and just taking five minutes for um, just grounding ourselves or just taking five minutes to check in with ourselves or with someone next to us. Um, a lot of staff will just start a meeting or um, a class by just asking folks, how are they doing? And just giving students a space to talk about that before we get into business. And especially during COVID-19, like, that is really crucial. And we can share too, what we're dealing with in our home lives, you know, what we're having to deal with as a result of COVID-19 to model that to students or to our peers um, and just practicing that in, in creating a culture where that is um, acceptable. Um, and then the last thing I saw this represented in the comments in the chat box too, so I wanted to mention that one of the strategies, strategies that we emphasize as also important is just prioritizing our own well-being as well. Um, we, we remind people who work directly with students that it's okay to not always be available um, and to set boundaries and that they too should be of the, the resource, be aware of the resources that are available to them, that they too should seek help when they need it and consider engaging in more mindfulness and self-care because 
um, what we are really aiming for is not only to impact young adults of today, but the young adults who will follow. And for, for that to happen, students need a full culture that more highly values, promotes, and talks about positive mental well-being. So in order to put our students first, we have to put ourselves first. And we all know that, but it's so hard to practice. And so that's a key piece I wanted to, to mention. Um, oh, and one other piece, you know, for folks who have trouble with prioritizing their own wellness, um, which actually many high achieving students struggle with, we sometimes reframe it as taking self responsibility and explaining that, um, you know, you'll actually get further in life if you proactively care for yourself and, and fill up your gas tank, so to speak. So instead of waiting until you're on empty, um, proactively taking care of yourself, you'll actually get further in your academics and your career by doing that. And, and that's always a helpful reframing for high achieving students when we need it. And, and that's all that I have, Scott, on this piece. That's great. So that's our, that's our presentation. Um, and I know that there were some questions that were sent in beforehand, and then there are some that were, um, that came in during the presentation, but um, we'll be happy to answer those. And if you have more, just um, please use that, that chat function. Laura, if you want to get started with some of the ones that we saw before uh, the yeah. session, that'd be great. Okay, go, sure. Go, go for it. Um, yeah, so prior to the session, um, Rob sent us a couple of questions. One of them was, um, what can we do to help reduce the stress of online honors programs for our high achieving students? And I hope that some of the strategies that I mentioned um, feel Sorry. applicable, um, that we can, you know, um, we can talk to our students when we have the opportunity about more than just academics. If it's helpful, you know, to take some Active Minds resources, which are often so free to students, and kind of sprinkle them in our newsletters or on our website, creating a space for that. Those little things um, communicate to students that when you're thinking about your academics, you should be thinking about your well-being. Um, and it, it communicates that we care about their well-being and therefore communicates that they should come to us um, if they need it. And um, by kind of also thinking about how we're presenting information, the deadlines around them, um, we can also help reduce the stress of, of high achieving students. Scott, did you have anything you wanted to add to that one? Um, no, but I did see something um, that I wanted to add. Uh, somebody asked about resources from, our, from, from the presentation, and there were a couple about Gen Z, and then uh, Laura, you had a couple as well. We'll combine those along with a uh, link to the study uh, information on the study that Active Minds and NSCS did. And um, if I'll, I think I'll, Rob, I'll send those to you if you can send them on to the participants. That'd be great. Okay, right. awesome. Um, there was another question about, um, you know, how to refer students to counseling services right now in a remote environment. And then, you know, virtual groups perhaps providing some support for students. And the one piece I want to mention there is just that um, if you're not connected to um, counseling centers, I, I don't know how many of you actually work on a campus, um, but if, if you are engaging with students as part of a campus um, context, it's really helpful to um, connect with your counseling center on campus, um, to become familiar yourself with what services are available. Many counseling services have, um, have pivoted their services online or offering tele teletherapy services and other things. Many counseling centers offering support groups. And um, if we're not trained clinicians, then we are really in that helper role. We really shouldn't feel the burden of having to um, do much more than referring our students to services and um, definitely not trying to uh, facilitate any support groups unless we're a clinician, although I think it's helpful to know that many, many counseling services do offer support groups, and if we know about them or know where students can find them, then we can help them connect with those that already exist. Anything you wanted to add there, Rob? We do have a quick follow-up question on when you're talking about deadline suggestions when would you suggest setting them for just to alleviate any other conflicts that students might be going through? Yeah, we often um, do ours at like 5 p.m. end of business day, even though end of business day doesn't mean much to students. Um, 
that it's a, it's a good time of day. So it gives them a full day if they need it um, to, to complete the assignment, um, but also, you know, prior to needing to um, go to sleep at night. Absolutely. I feel like you kind of touched on this a little earlier, but just to reemphasize, because a lot of people have asked this question, how do we preserve confidentiality within online and remote contact with students? Yeah, so, um, you know, I think it's important that we become familiar with our campus or organizational protocols around confidentiality. Um, you know, in a campus setting, many campuses have protocol around that. If, if a student has expressed, um, especially suicidal ideation or something more serious, like being in a crisis, often um, faculty and staff are mandated reporters and have special protocol they're, they're supposed to follow to help the campus. Um, certain folks on a campus committee, for example, be aware and be able to support you with that. Um, so there are, especially in a campus environment, things that you can promise and things you can't to students in terms of confidentiality. And it's important to be aware of that and to follow that protocol. Um, if a student is, is just expressing that they're struggling, um, you know, I think, again, the best thing we can do is provide that helper role. So be a listening ear, validate them, and then um, suggest as part of that refer piece, if you'd like, um, that you would be happy to help connect them to services if they'd like. And a lot of times students might express they're not ready for that or they don't think they need it. And what we often will, will suggest is, you know, just continuing to open that door for them um, and letting them kind of lead that. But if at the moment you, you become aware that a student's in more immediate distress, um, it is important to kind of shift gears and follow the protocol around that. And, you know, organizationally, um, I think we should each be thinking about, you know, what is the protocol on behalf of our organizations? Um, you know, Active Minds does that as well. We have a protocol that we follow when a student expresses concern. Um, so I hope that helps. Absolutely, thank you. Um, we have a question out of South Carolina. How do we as faculty balance the kind of compassion and listening that seems critical with sometimes hard line Title IX mandates? Hmm. Yeah, it can be it can be challenging. Um, and I know, you know, I experienced that in other contexts as well as where's the line in terms of compassion um, and understanding. And I think, you know, it's it's better to err on the side of um, speaking with students with compassion and empathy and um, absolutely no judgment. Um, when they're expressing, you know, what they're experiencing, what's true for them is true for them. And um, asking them, you know, what does support look like for you and setting boundaries around what we can and what we can't do in terms of support is really important. Um, Scott, do you have anything you would add to that? No, I think, uh, I think that, that's, that was good. I have one question dealing with the data that was gathered and the figure of 9.2 million students with mental health. Do you have any information on whether that 46% number varies across different kinds of institutions or within institutions across different dimensions of diversity that you had mentioned? Yeah, so we talked about that a little bit when we talked through trends is um, we do see that um, that, that, that um, all, you know, help seeking definitely differs depending on the type of school. Um, and mental health issues do tend to vary by school as well, um, school type. Um, the best data that we have on that in the student mental health field is the National Healthy Mind Study. And they do an annual report and it's actually very easy to read um, from a layperson perspective. And I really, um, if you're curious about looking into that data, I really encourage you all to go take a look. Um, they're not, of course, naming any schools, but they do show um, where there are some trends across school types. Um, a lot of different information about um, in terms of private versus public, residential versus commuter, um, that kind of thing, how these different issues range. Thank you. It looks like we don't have 
more questions surrounding your presentation, but do you guys have anything else you'd like to add? I don't have anything else to add, but um, I thanks everybody for participating. Um, hold on, it looks like we do have another couple of, couple of questions came in late. Yeah, so I see um, one about, do you see differences in stress and overwhelm across college career first year versus seniors? And yes, um, first year and second year students tend to be more at risk um, than juniors or seniors. And we saw that in our NSCS data as well. There were key differences between um, students just entering college versus those who are later on. And, and, and we see interventions on campus that kind of reflect that. There's a lot of focus on first year experience, for example, not just academically, but also on how can we support mental health. And it makes sense because so many students are making that transition from high school to college, and that's a very vulnerable um, stage for many students. Um, Two-year versus four-year colleges, there are definitely differences. Um, there's not a lot of data, not enough data there yet. Um, the Healthy Mind Study, I know, is trying to get more and more data from two-year colleges so that we can really look at the differences. Um, we do know, of course, the environment on two-year versus four-year is completely different. Many two-year colleges don't have a counseling center, for example, maybe just only a part-time counselor. Um, and so they have often lean on community partnerships to provide services to students. And so the campus um, environment and the way in which referrals can look are very different versus two year, four year. And we're, we're trying, we're hoping for more data soon so that we can look at how mental health issues differ across students um, in that way. Uh, John posted, um, he mentioned the increasing amount of neuroscience and educational research that affirms the crucial importance of sleep, exercise, nutrition, water, et cetera. And that's true. And with, with Gen Z, we're definitely seeing rates of media consumption and phone use, screen use, uh, higher than any other generation by, by a pretty wide margin. And those are associated with anxiety and they're associated with poor sleep. So absolutely, yeah. Yes. Um, yes, those are all protective factors, too, that we can try to support sleep, exercise, nutrition, water, and we encourage faculty and staff to ask students, you know, how's your sleep? Are you sleeping okay? Um, those kinds of questions, I think, are great questions to be asking when we're checking in with them. And I see one more. Um, is this practice actually helpful or is it better to tell students you grade easier if they get work turned in on time? That's interesting. <laughs> I think you guys are more of the experts in that, maybe, with your experience <laughs> with students. Um, I do, I can say that, you know, during COVID-19, we, we actually recently did a survey at Active Minds to kind of find out how COVID-19 is impacting the mental health of students now. And what was really surprising to me was the top stressor was academics and the uncertainty around what academic options might be available for students during this time and students feeling like their college leaders might not not might not understand that this isn't a vacation for them that this has been really tough to do their best work and so you know will there be pass fail grade accommodations or credit versus no credit what does that mean for my transcript if i choose those options um, so even though it's not directly mental health related, um, we've really started looking more at how can we support colleges and universities with supporting students' academics during this time and giving more flexibility and accommodations, knowing that that is a primary stressor driving mental health impact on students. Um, this last question, how can we better support students of color and other diversities? This is a great question we should be thinking about given the trends that I shared that students of color are less likely to seek help. Um, some of the things that we're doing are working with students of color to design programming um, that is for them, by them. We think that anytime we're looking to support students, we really need students to be equal partners in the work. And not all students are the same. And if we can really work hand in hand with, um, with students of color, then we learn from them um, how to best more effectively reach them and um, uh, how to put them, you know, in a place where they can support each other and share what's working for them and share, you know, what it's like seeking services um, as a student of color. And, and we know that that's highly effective. There's also the STEVE fund 
which is a national partner of ours that really specialize in supporting students of color with mental health. And they have a lot of resources and programming that you can access um, that can support you with this too. More questions coming in. This one, our program has an internal mentoring program and our mentors increasingly field questions about stress. What resources would you recommend I share with my student mentors? Um, have them check out Active Minds for sure. We have a ton of um, resources that are meant for students, student leaders who want to support mental health on their campus. Um, there's lots of information on our website, activeminds.org, about signs of distress, what to do. Um, our VAR tool, I think, is really helpful for student mentors who aren't trained clinicians but want to be there for their peers. Um, it was actually designed by students. So I think they might appreciate that. Um, another question, we have an issue of students wanting to be done with college as early and quickly as possible, supporting courage by counselors, um, especially parents. We have seen an increasing amount of students do early college. Um, many students begin their college career with an associate's already done. How can we combat this culture of racing through slash overburdening students? Scott, do you guys come across this at NSCS? Yeah, and it's a tricky balance because sometimes there are outside, I mean, there are outside forces at work here for sure. I mean, a lot of times it's going to be economic pressure to get to get through more quickly and, and save, um, save money. Um, I think it's about those one on one conversations and just finding out what's best for the student and make sure that they're taking care of themselves, making sure that they're considering the long-term impact of what they're doing versus the impact of maybe being in school for an extra, another semester or another year. Um, I think that the best that can be done is to have conversations about that because there are different forces, you know, at work. That's great. Any All right, questions? and with that, I don't see any other questions. So I just wanna thank everybody for being here. And we will be posting the recording of this session onto our site, as well as uploading the transcript of the chat that has been going on because there's been some really good resources in there. So we encourage you to continue this conversation on, your, on the NCHC discussion board through your NCHC profiles. And we just wanna thank Scott and Laura for taking the time to do this call with us today because I think it was an amazing one. So thank you. Thanks yeah. so much. Thank you for having yeah, us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Take care, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye. Bye. -bye.